In the field of psychology, Machiavellianism is a personality trait centered on manipulativeness, callousness, and indifference to morality with high levels of self-interest. The term is derived from a 16th century Italian philosopher named Niccolo di Bernardo Machiavelli and his most famous work, The Prince. In the underworld of the American Mafia, there have been some mafiosos who embody this personality trait. To them, the ends always justify the means. They are Machiavellian mobsters, and these are their stories. Number 19. Lewis. Bobby. Manna. Lewis Anthony Bobby Manna was born on December 2nd, 1929 in Hoboken, New Jersey. Young Lewis, who would be known as Bobby for most of his life, was entrenched in the culture of the Mafia from an early age. His father, Mauro Manna, was heavily involved in a number of rackets on the New Jersey waterfront, including running a large bootlegging operation during Prohibition. Along with being a top racketeer, Mauro Manna was also regarded by many of his contemporaries as an accomplished hitman. Mauro Manna would be incarcerated for the first time in 1917, many years prior to Bobby Manna's birth. Getting incarcerated would become a habit of Manna Sr., and he would eventually die in prison after being arrested on a hijacking charge in 1950. The apple would not fall far from the tree in the Manna family, and Bobby Manna would begin to work in the rackets from a very early age. By his early 20s, Bobby Manna ran bookmaking and numbers rackets on the Jersey Shore, as well as in New York City. He also developed a massive loan sharking book that rivaled some of the top mafiosos in the area. The younger Manna would soon be introduced to members of the Genovese family, including New Jersey powerhouse Gerardo Jerry Catina and Greenwich Village capo Anthony Tony Bender Strollo. Bobby Manna would develop a reputation for being a top earner as well as for being a stand-up guy. It was alleged that because of these top-notch qualities, Bobby Manna became a made man in the Genovese family just before the books closed when he was still in his mid-twenties. After being made, he would join Anthony Tony Bender Strollo's Greenwich Village crew where he would meet and befriend future Genovese power Vincent the Chin Gigante. Manna continued to develop his reputation for being both smart and ruthless. He would showcase these traits early on when he set up and ordered the murder of Patrick, Patty the Priest, Martinetti, and Marino Romito. Their bodies would be discovered on December 1st, 1957 in the back of a car in New Jersey. Despite being a member of the Greenwich Village crew, Bobby Manna would normally operate out of a cafe in Hoboken, New Jersey, named Casella's. Casella's, which at a glance operated more like a mob social club than a public restaurant, was owned by Manna's right-hand man, Martin Casella. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Bobby Manna would become one of the richest members of the Genovese family. While he still had his numbers, gambling, and loan sharking, Manna began branching out into labor racketeering, taking over multiple construction unions, garbage hauling unions, and even gaining influence with the local Longshoremen's Association. He also started or muscled in on several legitimate businesses that helped to justify his income, as well as adding to his already growing wealth. In 1971, Bobby Manna would be sent to prison at Yardville Correctional Facility in New Jersey for refusing to testify before the New Jersey State Commission of Investigation on Organized Crime. There, he would become close friends with Philly mobster Nicodemo Scarfo. He would also rub shoulders with a number of New Jersey-based mobsters such as Genovese acting boss Jerry Catina, Philadelphia boss Angelo Bruno, North Jersey family boss Sam DeCalvacante, Genovese capo Richie the Boot Boyardo, and Bonanno capo Bayonne Joe Ziccarelli. After his release, he would continue to rise in the ranks of the Genovese family, becoming the head of the Genovese family's operations in New Jersey by the late 1970s. In 1980, Philadelphia consulier Antonio Caponegro would approach Genovese front boss Frank Funzi Thierry about the removal of Angelo Bruno as the boss in Philly. Bruno was at that time a proxy commission vote for the Gambino family, making the Gambinos the most powerful seat on the commission. Thierry and the Genovese leadership saw this as an opportunity to install someone more friendly with the Genovese family as the boss of Philadelphia. 
This would also give the Genovese an excuse to take over Caponegro's North Jersey Rackets. While Thierry enticed Caponegro to go forward with his plan, Bobby Manna was sent to speak with his old friend Nicky Scarfo and solidify their relationship. Manna allegedly asked Scarfo, if God forbid something were to happen to Angelo Bruno, where would the Philadelphia family stand in relation to the Genovese? To this question, Scarfo allegedly replied, Un familia, which translates in English to one family. Caponegro would eventually move forward, killing Bruno. Shortly thereafter, Caponegro was called to New York, where he would be double-crossed by Thierry and the Genovese. Caponegro and his brother-in-law, Alfred Salerno, were brutally tortured and murdered for the killing of a sitting commission member. Scarfo and Manna acted as the go-betweens for the Genovese and the Philly mob. Phil Testa would be named the boss of Philadelphia, and he would name Nicky Scarfo as his consulier. Shortly after being named boss, Testa would be killed by his underboss, Pete Casella, and a powerful Philly captain named Frank Narducci. With Manna's help, Nicky Scarfo would be elevated to the position of boss of the Philadelphia family. With Scarfo in control, the Philly mob was now aligned with the Genovese family, making their alliance the most powerful on the commission. Bobby Manna remained the conduit to the Philly mob via his close-knit relationship to Nicky Scarfo. Shortly after the turmoil in Philadelphia, behind-the-scenes boss Philip Benny Squince Lombardo would officially step down as head of the family. There were many who thought that former underboss Fat Tony Salerno would be elevated to the position of boss. However, when the dust settled, the new boss was to be Mana ally Vincent the Chin Gigante. Gigante, like his predecessor Lombardo, would operate out of the shadows, delegating responsibilities to others in the administration. Salerno would take over Thierry's role as front boss and would handle day-to-day family affairs and sit on commission meetings. Saverio Sammy Black Santora would be named underboss and supervise the majority of the capos in the family. Meanwhile, Gigante would elevate his longtime friend Bobby Manna to the position of family consulier. Along with the consulier position, Manna would also act as a street boss, supervising four capital regimes in the New Jersey area. He would also rent an apartment in Greenwich Village, New York, to be closer to Gigante's headquarters at the Triangle Social Club. This gave him a place to stay when acting as a member of the Genovese administration. In 1987, Manna began pushing the Genovese family to murder John Gotti, the new boss of the Gambino family. A Gambino capo, Gotti had arranged the murder of Gambino boss Paul Castellano in 1985 and had taken control of the Gambino family without the approval of the commission. Manna was especially unhappy about Gotti's unsanctioned coup against Castellano. In addition, Gotti wanted to take the lucrative South Jersey holdings that used to belong to the Philadelphia crime family and leave the less desirable North Jersey territory to the Genovese. Between August 1987 and January 1988, the Federal Bureau of Investigation recorded 12 conversations in which Manna and other Genovese mobsters discussed murdering John Gotti, Gene Gotti, and New York contractor Irwin Schiff. When discussing the John Gotti murder, Manna advised the hitman to wear a disguise, as the target area was fairly open. On August 8, 1987, Erwin Schiff was shot in the head by Genovese hitman Richard DeCicio while dining at a Manhattan restaurant. The hit was approved by Gigante and ordered by Manna directly. Louis Bobby Manna was later indicted and on June 26, 1989, Manna was convicted of conspiring to murder John Gotti, Gene Gotti, and Erwin Schiff in aid of racketeering. On September 26, 1989, Judge Marianne Trump Berry, sister of the former President of the United States, Donald Trump, sentenced Manna to 80 years in federal prison. In 2004, it was revealed by the FBI that prior to Manna's sentencing, he was involved in a murder plot targeting Judge Marianne Trump Berry, the United States Attorney Samuel A. Alito, and Chief Prosecutor Michael Chertoff. In December 2020, the 91-year-old Manna requested compassionate release, but was denied. 
He was denied release again in November of 2021. As of December 2021, Mana is incarcerated at the Federal Medical Center in Rochester, Minnesota. With a projected release date of November 7, 2054, Bobby Mana will likely never breathe free air again. While the ending is not a happy one for Bobby Mana, he will be remembered as one of the most crafty, ruthless, and intelligent mobsters of the era, and a true believer in the ideals of Cosa Nostra. He is without a doubt a Machiavellian mobster.